ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5 is the bullpen with the producers here at ESPN Radio. Myself, Brian McDonald, found on Twitter, at Sack by BMAC, Sean Mapes of the Gallant and George and the Dale Olalea show of basically the half, the, well, half, yeah, exactly half the shows exactly, here on the station exactly the can be show. found on Twitter at Sean A. Mapes and our man behind the glass today. Today is uh, Cam Smith. He can be found on Twitter at Clutch City Cam. Uh, we're going to start with the Astros, but I, I think I want to throw a disclaimer up front. Like, obviously, there's a lot of bad to talk about. What? There's a lot of bad to talk what? about, right? But, like, I I, I even had, so me me and one of my, my, my best friends will have, and we start, it started off because he was truly pessimistic about the Astros years ago, and now it's just continued as tradition to hopefully keep everything going because mm-hmm. why break tradition? I guess it's a superstition thing. He saw the the whatever the headstone uh yeah no the, the, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's not quite it's not quite that far back uh but we always have a bet every year like whether or not they could win the division or, or whatever and we had some disagreements and like on like our prediction for the the astros to start the year and he's already texting me like see told you so like and i've seen these you know i think cam pointed out that he was seeing this on twitter too about how people were acting like the world is ending after two games so disclaimer we're going to talk about a lot of negative stuff because look they're 0 2 but yeah. let's let's all relax Houston it's still a really good baseball team that uh-huh. oh, sh- haven't won a game <laughs> Sean's poking the bear it's like Dylan Brooks over here he, he pokes <laughs> the bears. Dylan Brooks of Houston right now yeah, um, well, sellers at the deadline I don't know <laughs> sellers at the de- here we are on uh March 30th yeah March 30th should the Astros sell 7-1-3 uh, no, but if you do have any thoughts on what we're going to talk about today, uh, obviously we're starting Astros, as I mentioned. We're going to talk about your Houston Rockets, 11 in a row now, after a one-point win over the hated Jazz. Uh, maybe talk some Texans in the second hour. And, of course, Mount Rushmore, plus one at 130. But if you want to get into the conversation, give us a call on the HRMP listener line at 713-780-3776. So, I, I guess let's start with the starting pitchers um, for, the, for the first two games of the Astros. And I think it was... I, I really, I don't even know if it's a, a, it's an I think. I think it's probably definite unless you want to insert, you know, the Verlander's injury timeline into it. But probably the starting pitchers that people were most concerned about as far as both having question marks and you also needed, like, upper-level performances from them. Like, because you didn't really need upper-level performances from J.P. France and Ronel Blanco, right? No. It's not that, that they don't have question marks. You just don't need them to be aces. But you needed Fromber and Javier yeah. to be... It, you know, the really, question, really good. The questions you're asking it, are different for the guys that are the first two arms in your rotation yeah, than exactly. the last two arms in your rotation. So one of them answered it really well. I mean, Christian Javier, uh, what was it, six innings, no earned runs. I don't have his strikeout number uh, in front of me. Six but, strikeouts, four hits. Yeah, and I believe he only one he, walk. One walk, exactly, which was a big thing good for him because that was uh, especially like the walks and then also uh, being able to get into the sixth inning because even when he's gone well in, in past years, that's been something that's hampered him, like the high pitch counts, walking people. Only, only he eventually gets out of it, but then he's out of the game, you know, after four and two thirds or five innings and the bullpen gets stacked. Yeah, only through uh, 90 pitches to get through six innings. Yeah, that's even a number like obviously start one. I would never advocate to send Javier back out there, but certainly if, if this was like a postseason start. Or a must-have game he in probably, September. Yeah, he probably he could have. He, he might have gone back out there for the seventh inning as well. So very efficient day for Christian Javier. Uh, did you, I? I don't have Apple TV. Did you get to see the game? Uh, I also don't have okay. Apple TV well, Plus, but Cam, I. Did, did, but did you, did you but I, oh, oh. I was able to watch the game. Oh, uh, okay. All right. So we'll go to we'll go to hear your thoughts on here. This is a second Cam, but I um, so fill me in. Like I, I mean, I look at the stat line for Christian Javier. And it looks like it's a pretty good carryover from what we saw in the spring, at least from his numbers. I watch, I wasn't watching a lot of TV broadcasts for the spring, mm-hmm. but I mean the the obviously the the good amount of innings, good work rate, the strikeouts are there. Everything looks great on paper. How do he look to you? No, he looked good. He he looked uh, just about as good as the numbers. I mean the strikeouts. You kind of wish there's a little bit more strikeouts than six, but that I mean still. Like like we we're talking about the ninety pitches to get through six innings that he was at a good pace. We've kind seen of him throughout use, the game. Yeah, we've seen him use ninety pitches get to through get through three. three. Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah, I I think Javier delivered exactly what you want. You know, it was it was a if if we get Christian Javier doing this. Oh yeah, no four I, out of five starts this year, you'll be perfectly fine with him. 
Yeah, uh, a few weeks ago, and, and it was admittedly a hot take because it was part of uh, Cash or Trash on the Killer Bees, which we do every Tuesday. But my opinion a few weeks ago was that I thought Javier, once we started getting reports that his fastball was a back up, like the velocity was back up, that I thought he could be the best pitcher in the Astros rotation this year. Certainly, I mean, you don't expect him to go six shutout every game. That's no. uh, He will not have a zero ERA uh, come in September. That will not happen. His ERA, well, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, but uh, he, certainly an encouraging start from Christian Javier. Before we get to Frommer Cam, I, I don't know how much of the first two games you've gotten to see. I don't know if you're one of the uh, the elites with Apple TV Plus, but uh, or Sean, who may or may not have illegally the streamed it. Aladdin, uh, uh, <laughs> Take from the Rich, or the uh, Robin Hood of Apple but, TV. But uh, what are you, what are your thoughts on Javier and what you've seen from the Astros so far? Well, I mean, middle relief is obviously atrocious, yeah. but you know, going to going to Javier, and the funny thing is, is I, again, you mentioned we talked about this a couple weeks ago when we were talking about the Astros pitchers, and I think we were all kind of in agreement that Fromber is probably the most important, but Javier, if he can get things right, might be the guy that has the filthiest, right, and possibly could have the best season, and he did everything that we hoped he would do. He went six innings instead of five innings. It, you know, granted, 90 pitches for six innings is a lot, but I'll take six innings of 90 pitches over than five innings. What did he give up, like four hits, only one walk? Yeah, four hits, one walk. I mean, his, his pitches were were filthy. Yeah. Like, he pitched as great as you could hope Christian Javier's first start of the season would be. It's just that bullpen is, oh. Yeah, and, and six innings is actually kind of what you need on most nights, or sure, at least yeah. when you— when you think uh, the bullpen is whole, because in that scenario, that's what we talked about all uh, off season. Basically, since they signed Josh Hader, is that the starter needs to go six, and it's Brian Abreu, it's Ryan Presley, and it's Josh Hader. Game over. Game over. Unfortunately, Brian Abreu was still serving a uh, is it a two game suspension. It was I a two, yeah, two, it was two or a three game suspension. Two so game suspension. He'll so be this back is tonight. <laughs> he'll be back tonight. Really could have used them last night. Yeah, and Ryan Presley, he his um, I, maybe if it was the postseason, he might have been made available. And I don't know if Joe Espada like officially said one way or the other, but the with the amount of pitches that he threw in Game One, I didn't see that there was any way he was going to be available for this game. I thought Josh Hader could have been, but obviously it, it never got to the point where you would use yeah. him, so it, it didn't end up mattering. Especially once um, Taylor Scott came in, Oof, gave up gas gave man. up two runs, then it's like all right. Uh, well, the, Ryan, the, Ryan Presley does not need a pitch in no. this game. And the whole no. Presley thing, even the first game, like, look, obviously he took a hit when they brought in Hayter because he thought he was going to be the closer. Hayter's going to be the closer. So Ryan thinks he's going to be the eighth inning guy. But then in that first game, what did they bring him in? The sixth inning? Like the uh, seventh, seventh inning? Seventh like, inning. so they didn't even use him as the new position or, you know, innings pitcher that he initially thought he was going to be. So it's just kind of like, I, where I, are we going with I this? I think he came in He came in the seventh because he was going to face Judge uh, Rizzo and Stanton, right? Right, right. So they, he, brought, he brought him in an inning early just to face the three best uh, hitters in that lineup, and obviously it didn't go well for uh, – for Presley, but I I also had the same thing when when they came back and they're like Ryan Presley coming out and I'm like huh in the set I, I thought I missed weird. an inning it felt weird and that was something that we talked about on the Killer Bees both in the moment and then uh, yesterday when but, we had time to but then when you see who he's facing you're like yeah oh, I, that's that's kind of where I'm going with him it. or Taylor Scott who do you want <laughs> who do you want facing him, Judge him or those, M- M- or you know. yeah those are my worries because it's like I feel like this team has a track record of being inconsistent with what they want with their pitchers. And, like, I don't want to bring it way back in the day, but those days where it was Wagner, Lidge, and Dotel, right. those dudes knew exactly what inning they were coming in every single game. And that's why they had one of the most dynamic bullpens for, like, two or three years. But the last couple of years, you see guys coming in the sixth, the eighth. It's just kind of like, is this inconsistency really getting to these guys' heads? I think part of it is that Brian Abreu would have been in the seventh. Like the, that, both, yeah, both these games, the math, both these sure. games, you can just go, well, Brian Abreu would have been in the seventh. So I, I do understand what you're saying. Some of that is just like baseball, like the way pitchers get used in baseball is just way different than it was back in what, back 2000, 2003, 2004. Um, so some, some of that's just the differences in baseball. But that is true. Uh, that is something to – to look at with with Ryan Preston because we all know, yeah, maybe this shouldn't affect how you pitch, but we all know it does affect how some guys pitch. 
Yeah, it does. The routine, the routine of it. I, I I looked into this like before the season started to see if there was much of a difference, like Presley in non-safe situations in his career versus safe situations. And his ERA was higher in non-safe situations, but it went from like a three-one to a three-three. So yeah. it wasn't was it, it was wasn't something crazy. where like oh my god, he suddenly becomes well Rafael Montero when he's not in the safe situation. So I. I I get the concern, and I, I hear what Cam's saying, but I think this is just a product of, like, the new day and age of uh, analytics and baseball. Like, like Dotel or Lidge Dotel Wagner that the Astros used in 2003, that wasn't a game that was as reliant on an analytics, or, I mean, maybe even at all, especially compared to nowadays. And it, I think it's exactly what you mentioned. It was something that we brought up with the Killer Bees of, like, do you have a problem with this decision by Joe Espada? But when you look at who was coming up in the uh, in the batting order uh, when the inning started, uh, like you said, I'm pretty sure it was Aaron Judge and then Rizzo and Stan in some order. So I I, I get maybe the idea of messing when where Presley comes in could be a problem. But you need your best guys from the best parts of the lineup are up. I mean, what are you going to do? Throw up some middle reliever you don't trust when Aaron Judge is coming up? No, I mean to me. And again, this solves itself with Brian Braves available because then it doesn't matter because then you still have your eighth inning guy, whether it be Presley or Bray, you face in the heart of the order. You still have the other guy available for the eighth inning. So the part of this is a product of Brian Bray, you not being available. But to me, I like the analytics approach of, look, that's the most dangerous part remaining in this game. I'm going to put in what my, one of my guys, one of my stoppers to, to it didn't work, but in theory to, to yeah. keep to keep this game uh, close. Yeah. And, and part of that is just, hey, Ryan Presley. You're not the closer anymore. This is what we're leaving. Like, Brian Abreu has to do that. Yeah, Brian, Brian Abreu does it. No problem. <laughs> yeah, so th it's a little bit of like, this is your new role, man. Um, I will say, though, not this uh, Brian Abreu coming back doesn't mean for the next 160 games, no problem. Because, like we mentioned with uh, Presley maybe not being available last night, there are going to be nights where one of Presley... For sure, Hater or, or, or Bray, yeah, yeah, are aren't available just because they pitched three days in a row or something. So there are there's going to be a lot of games where they have to figure it out with the same set of circumstances that they've had the last two games, and that's where it gets worrying. I mean, some of that is, I I mean, I just don't think that these guys are going to have like. 70 eras the entire year like <laughs> they're gonna be able to get God, out of what? an inning clean like I, no, i'm looking one, i'm looking right now I, I, both I, I, days uh, okay go ahead both days no one got out of an inning clean no no one in the rotation or no one in the bullpen got out of no an one inning got out clean. of the oh wow oh okay. no wait josh hey jo well, josh hater went one two three, three yeah I, I was just yeah. looking i was looking at the middle relief okay uh, yeah. So I know Montero – well, Montero gave up a home run in game one, and then he walked in a run yesterday, yes. right? Uh, uh, Mashinsky, obviously. Mashinsky, abs absolute <laughs> gas can. Uh, Taylor, wow. I mean, Taylor Scott in the first game, one inning, uh, one walk, one strikeout, no but run. So he was fine in that game. In the second game, he did Second that. game, he, that's, that's he what blew saying. up. No, right. one, no one's gone the last two games clean. I, I guess Brandon Belak, but – oh, no, Brandon Belak. No, Belak gave up a run he yesterday gave up the as home well. Run. Yeah. yeah, so – I mean, I guess it ultimately didn't matter by the time it got to him because I don't know what was this. What would have been the score of the game? One. Six one at the yeah. time, and it ends up seven one. So I, uh, I mean, ultimately, what Brandon B like gives up isn't all that consequential to the outcome of the game. Yeah, he gave up the last run of the game, and he was basically just mop up duty at that point. Yeah. He went in inning in two thirds, but yeah, this look uh, one of the big things we talked about uh, as far as what will be possibly a limiting factor for the Astros this year is there's middle relief and. Yeah, it's kind of been a problem. Now, I will say, because in the same conversation with my buddy, like because part of his reasons why he was only projecting the Astros to win 88 games and we were going back and forth was, oh, the middle relief is terrible, which, yeah, it's been really bad. But we can't put game one on the middle relief. I, I get that Montero gave up the home run, but it was it was it was Presley obviously who gave given up a run and then Frommer melting down towards yeah. the, the latter part of his start. Yeah. Those are four of the five runs you allowed. The middle relief, quote unquote, only allowed one of the five runs that day. You can't put game one on the middle relief. No, well, and you also I can't agree. beat the Yankees if you're going to score five runs in two games. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's carry it over. There's there's so much again. It's too. I, we were talking a lot of negative, but again, still two, two games, games. Is, where everything's fine. Uh, this is the meme of the dog in, in the house. It's no, all no, it's, it's out, not. It's that means, that, oh, that actually, means it's not right. fine. It's the opposite of that. Yes, you're right. It's the opposite <laughs> of that. I got it. I got it wrong. Blame it on the old guy. Sorry. This isn't fine, this and is it's a nice <laughs> house. <laughs> yes. Can we start that meme? 
Or where the uh, dog is in like this luxury, like he's in the Cliff Kingsbury house. I'll for, start working. For, from the, yeah, thank you, Sean. That's it's, it's the Lord's work that you're doing. All right, we're going to continue the Astros conversation over the other side. Eventually, we'll, like I said, we're going to get into the Rockets win streak, uh, get into some conversation about the Texans, specifically on things Saquon Barkley had to say about uh, where his uh, first choice would have been during free agency. And then at 1.30, we will have, of course, the groundbreaking award-winning segment, Mount Rushmore Plus One. Uh, but Astros on the other side of the break when we get back on the bullpen, ESPN Radio 97.5 and You're listening to The Bullpen on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Welcome back in ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5. Credit to Sean for possibly coming up with a great idea for an Mount Rushmore plus one. I might, do. Be, might be sacrilegious. We'll see if we get to it. I, I, some some light sacrilege? I, I'm Look, I'm not against light sacrilege. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm look. I, I'm I'm just going to go on record and saying a, a light sacrilege is tolerable. Like light treason. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> today's not. Yeah, exactly. Light treason. Today's not Easter. Tomorrow's Easter. Okay. So we can be a little lightly sacrilegious uh, yet, uh, today, but uh, uh, we'll we'll make sure to cut that out by tomorrow when uh, when uh, when uh, the Easter Bunny is out giving out eggs or whatever he does. Uh, this year I'll catch him. <laughs> what you got traps out? <laughs> I, I I'd love to see. That. Yeah, we need a social media post for you, Sean, where you fake that you caught the caught, caught just some random ass body and his head's up when he might. Just That's, someone's dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I finally caught the bastard. <laughs> he didn't even have eggs. <laughs> oh, all right. So back into the Astros. And uh, we spent obviously last, a lot of last segment talking about some of the, the bad vibes with the middle relievers. Um, uh, let, let's get into two more uh, bad vibe areas before we move on to some of the good vibes and positive things that we. I think we could take out despite the 0-2 loss because, again, it's only 0-2. Yeah. It's, 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 I, I remember I looked it up and did the math um, when it was 0-1 because I think people I – mean, what were we saying about the Texans after 0-2? Like, they look terrible. I mean, they, 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 they don't score a touchdown against the Ravens. The Colts, you know, bully ball them all around the field at NRG. And that the equivalent of, the, of a Texans 0 2 start for a baseball season is the first 19 games. That was after one, so I guess it would be, I don't know what the math would be now. I'm not going to try to do it on the air. I'm not Joe George, but anyway, it's very early on in the season. So, I mean, the math isn't good by Joe. I mean, you, 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 we, you, we, you, you it's heard? shocking. <laughs> <laughs> it's sho- sometimes the math is Ooh. shocking. Where I, I'm, I I'm looking, I'm trying, I'm not trying to figure out the qu- the. <laughs> 
the whatever Matthew's trying to do because sometimes it's hard to follow what he's even trying to do. I am just trying to follow how he's, how he's getting, getting the numbers that. that he's getting. Yeah, his, his, I'm, I'm trying to diagnose where he's going wrong. His, his baseball math, I guess it was on Wednesday, was quite shocking. But he had a we had well, it was actually also baseball yesterday where he started to try to think of total Astros home games possible and somehow had the number in the 190s. <laughs> and the number 70 was bantied about, or I'm like, it's 81 at least. Oh, uh, little Joe, but math, not, not, not a strong suit. Uh, so some other bad vibes I think we got to talk about again before we get into the good vibes. Uh, I mean, let's, uh, let's, let's, I guess, finish the, close the book or finish the conversation with Framber Valdez. I mean, I'm not going to – I don't want to rush to say, like, oh, my God, it's the same Fromber from the second half of last season, but six walks. I mean, <laughs> so, like, if, if it was just, like, okay, he gave up, you know, a couple of solo bombs where he missed a spot, like, okay, that's one thing, but six walks? Like, I'm – I don't know. Like, I, I'm very, like, open to, like, completely dismissing the first two games. I mean, Cam, Sean taught me off the ledge, but six walks? I, I Fromber, mean, come on, man. I, I can't really talk you off that much. I mean, you expect him to be better than he was. Now, Six walks yeah. and four and two-thirds. The good news is and that he— Oh, that's not even include him hitting a guy. Yeah, well, he was able to work himself out of uh, a couple jams. It's exactly. It could have been so much worse. He, he got, what, two uh, inning-inning double yeah. plays in the, in the four and two-thirds? Yes, words? I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's a— uh, point four no, or against him i don't think it's <laughs> though, a point four. That, hey hey it could have been worse yeah <laughs> i'm i'm more concerned about fromber than the astros zero and two starts because again you have 160 games left they're gonna get it together they're still verlander still out but fromber like this is this is what we were all nervous about because we saw his inconsistency last year and those walks were increasing and six walks in this first game like ever since they hit him with that new uh the new little pitching thing Oh it, yeah, the pitch clock. It, that, I really it, think he hasn't he hasn't good, been man. the same. Like he 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 did. We and we we saw so many like national fans who hadn't watched Fromber all year like melt down about. Oh my God, he's got substance on his glove or his hand or whatever that nonsense was during the 2022 World Series. But he's not able to step off the mound and do. The, he had this whole routine where he'd wipe his brow and like take off his hat and then massage his hand. I don't know. Like there's so many. I don't know. Fromber's such a head case. There's. there's I mean, it could be that, or it could be the fact that he's wearing a white jersey on Thursday instead of a blue jersey. True. Or it could be that he's looking, you know, 60 feet away and it's no longer Maldi and it's now Yonder Diaz. Like, I, Fromber is so all, all over the place, it's hard to pinpoint exactly what is scrambling his brain. But, man, it's six walk. <laughs> a little bit of it is like, wait, so it's all these things? Like, yeah, it where, could be. It could where be it's... all of the above. Or, or, and just the fact that it's like so... So it's not just Mal- so you need Maldi, you need no pitch clock, which is you need Maldi, which isn't gonna happen. You need no pitch clock, <laughs> right. which isn't gonna happen. The only thing you could have had was the blue jersey. The jersey. They, they didn't even do the blue jersey. And, and it, so it's a little oh, bit. Also got rid of the hair. Yeah, uh, maybe it, we, uh, I was hoping the hair was the problem, but clearly it's a not little the bit of like I don't know, dude. You need all that, and it's still like kind of shaky about what how how good you're gonna be. It's like you might it's, not you. You might not all be right. that good of a pitcher. I'm let, sorry let, if you let, need let, all that. You can that. say you need Maldi, but let's not. Okay, Fromber didn't have perfect games with Maldi last year either. Fromber yeah, had bad games with Maldi too. Yeah, so yeah, it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was I think the point. Yeah, he's I, melted I, down. Uh, that, that's the, that's what I'm saying. There's all these excuses for him. It's like I don't know, maybe pitch better. I, that's <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was crazy I was, thought of hey, just throw strikes, stop <laughs> walking, guys. I was definitely a little tongue in cheek mentioning Maldi because you, like you said, like the second half of last season, I'm sure plenty of the meltdowns happened, including, the, you know, obviously the ALCS against the Rangers. That happens with Mal- with uh, Maldi behind the plate. Uh, but you know, let me let me try this comparison on for size uh, a little bit. See, let's see what you guys think about this one. You mentioned uh, Sean about like, well, you need all these things to like be in perfectly in place for you to play well. Maybe you should just play better. Maybe you aren't that good. Isn't that kind of what we would say about like a game manager quarterback in the NFL? Like, oh, he can be, he can, he can win if he has like great protection from his offensive line. He has great wide receivers, great running grade, great scheme. Are we kind of calling Fromber Matt Schaubish? Everything is perfect around him. He can be a pro bowler who leads the league in passing like he did in 2009. But if anything around him is not perfect, then he's throwing pick sixes in four straight games. So th- this is. That's that's good work by you, B Mac. Thank because you. at Thank first you. I was a little 
pat at, on the back here. At first, I was like, "What the hell is this dude talking about? <laughs> I can't wait! I can't wait for the segment to be over." And then, and then, as he started explaining, I was like, "You know what? There is a little bit of that. Not so much as like game, like a starting pitcher being a game manager, but it speaks to that. That that's why." That's why to go mo- further down the kind of quarterback rabbit hole, yeah, he he is kind of the Dak Prescott, you know, Kirk Cousins, where he is a very right. very good, not game manager because that's like a loaded term, but he's like a very good quarterback that has a ceiling. He is a very good starting pitcher that has a ceiling, whereas even someone like Christian Javier is more of a a toolsy guy who hasn't actually all put it together. You can't quite say. That he's better than Fromber, but when th- he can kind of make his own luck, you, you kinda, he can you kinda, he can make his own luck with the electric stuff that right. he has. A you lot feel like, like his ceiling's higher. Yeah, a lot like someone I don't know, like Anthony Richardson or you know, or Justin Herbert, who has done less in the league than those than right. Dak or but it's very Cousins. toolsy, very toolsy, and you can kind of see it like he can kind of make his own luck. Whereas guys like that, they can't. And Fromber, maybe maybe it's just a little bit of not being a crazy velocity guy, having to be more of a gr- ground ball pitcher, where it's like he he's very location, 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 and six walks, six <laughs> walks. You're not doing a good job of that. So when it's ugly, it's super ugly, like it is for those game manager type quarterbacks. He's like a snowballer. I mean, when 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 yeah. things start bad, they just continue to go bad with Frommer, and if things start good, it seems like they continue yeah. to go good. But it's like he can't. He can't get out of his like his own way. Like yeah. once it's once it's bad, like it's it's He's probably gonna, gonna stay bad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we saw you know obviously we've seen when it goes bad, it goes bad recently. But like you're saying, when it goes well, it's 25 straight quality starts. It's it's a no hitter. It, when it's rolling, it's rolling, rolling. So I I don't know it. He he's. I, I, he's just such a confounding pitcher. There, there really isn't. I mean, maybe you have a better like you can find a better uh you know case from from history what of a guy that was like this and yeah, then pulled it out like i cannot i cannot think of a oh, guy man. who's been like or especially like a pitcher who's been right. like this cuz from time you'll I uh, maybe Lidge, but Lidge wasn't exact. Where Lidge, like Lidge was, yeah, he he went through lights out and then cut a uh, the super scars rough. The, the scars from Pujols like shattered him for and a then, while, and then came out. And with then the he fills. became. I think he won a Cy Young as the as the as the closer. I know he had like a perfect. Uh, yeah, maybe perfect maybe season. it was just like a perfect where he was. Anyway, he was really really good yeah. once he got to Philadelphia. But so. as a starter, it's a little bit different because we've seen other relievers go through hot and cold streaks like right. Lidge does. We just we haven't really seen a pitcher where it, it is very good, very consistent, and then inconsistent, and then back to consistency. Maybe and then inconsistent with a per, or with the no hitter mixed in. Maybe, and then back to inconsistency again. And then come out clean on the other side. Maybe Blake Snell. Because like Blake Snell had the Cy Young season in Tampa. And then obviously he had a Cy Young season last year with San Diego, but in between that, uh, those four seasons in between, he had two seasons where his ERA was north of 4.20. Now I don't think it's quite as as horrible as maybe the ups yeah. and downs that Frombers had, but in those seasons where his ERA was north of 4.20, I mean he was having a lot of games where he was walking tons of batters. He was only going like three, four innings and, and getting and getting removed from the game early. I don't know if that quite. And obviously he got it back on track last season. I don't know if that quite. Meets the criteria we're talking about, but that's the only thing that kind of jumps but to my mind the right dif- now. The difference is that's like a little bit of like, I I mean I don't remember hearing anything about like the Blake Snell like the mental side of right. Blake Snell's yeah. pitching. That's a good where point. so much about Fromber is like the mental side of Fromber. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I've mentioned it. You know, the, not to, not to beat a dead horse because I know I've mentioned it a few times here. I've mentioned it in the Killer Bees, but. I think it was telling what we saw in that postseason start against the against the uh, against the Twins, where he started Game Two, the game that they lost, the only game in that series that they lost. Fromber starts, and when it snowballed on him, they you could hear the 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 announcers talk about it because everyone started picking up on it. Carlos, led by Carlos Correa, the Twins from the dugout were were chirping, cha- chirping yeah. and chattering and, and and getting in Fromber's ear because they knew they could shake him and they shook him. And yeah, it, 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 yeah, I don't know. Look, I mean, they've obviously he got rid of the braids. They switched up the jersey, all the uh, the stuff like from Major League with a uh, what was it, Jubu S- Serrano, <laughs> Serrano, yeah. yeah. Like they've done all that sort of stuff for Fromber, and it hasn't seemed to matter. So 
Yeah. I don't know, man. Six walks just I I I think I think okay, I'll have one rush to judgment today. Overall, it doesn't matter. It's two games in. I might be on the same page with you. One rush to judgment. I'm not paying Fromber a long term contract. Oh yeah. F, I, I was already that. I was already like Okay, what where, where, where do you think I was going? That Fromber is just not that dude? Not on the twenty twenty five Astros. Ooh. <laughs> Okay, well, that'll be the, that's kind of the same take, though, because that's when his contract's up, right? After 2025. Okay. I'm oh, also, oh, he's gone before <laughs> his con- Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Not, not this season. Like, so, like, being traded away. Interesting. Maybe in the offseason. I don't know. As oh, opposed man, to, he keeps walking six dues. I don't know what his market's going to be, but I guess yeah. it doesn't maybe, matter at uh, a certain point. Maybe it's too late to trade him. Yeah. Yeah, well, if he if he has a if he if he's lights out in his next turn, like maybe start calling some people. Like, I'm like hey, he's back. Don't worry about it. everything's good yeah. now. Yeah. yeah, go ahead and again take, take him on Guardians. Only the first two games. We are not. Yeah, uh, we're not freaking out. Other, not than freaking. Fromber. Other than Fromber, other <laughs> Fromber. the one where I'm. Yeah. The rest I can kind of go like this is kind of the worst case scenario for this. You know, we're, let's let's blow a little bit past the break here, just because I want to end on at least one positive note. Uh, yeah, note. Let's, let's get some. Let's, positive let's get some there. good vibes in, and Cam contribute with. Some, well, with one of your good vibes here i've got some on the google doc so take any take anything you want let's all talk about one uh thing that we loved uh from these first couple of games man yonder diaz just picked up right where he left off i was gonna say yiner he had three yiner hits with a stick three hits in his uh three hits in game one they had another hit last night i mean there was i think people had concern because he never walked he chased a lot in his rookie year that maybe once the film got out the book got out on him then maybe people would start to figure out how to pitch around him but early results, Yonder still looks great. No, nope. yeah, exactly. Uh, that whatever, uh, obviously he's not going to hit the way he he's what four for seven. Yeah, he's, he's not, not going to have four hits out of every two yeah, games. Yeah, but the what he gives you on offense, whatever, whatever, unless Marty Maldonado was like the greatest pitching coach of all time <laughs> and the greatest game caller of all time, what Yonder Diaz gives you with his bat makes it already so much worth uh, losing Martin oh, Maldonado. Yeah. I'm totally I with mean, you. What are we talking about? All I mean, right. it, it's kind of hard to argue yeah. Yonder not being the most, like, positive thing. I mean, it's good to see that Jeremy Pena has, like, three hits in two games, and Kyle and Tucker's oh, got that, three that hits in two games. Legged, that single he legged into a double in game one, man, he oh, yeah. smoked that ball. Um, and showed great legs to, to run it out, because it wasn't like the ball got to the wall. Like, he, yeah. he really had to, to haul out. And uh, just one last one. Uh, Josh Hader, money well spent. Man, <laughs> for the, he was, he <laughs> money was so well dominant. Just that, three up, three down, three strikeouts. See you later. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Ryan Blew people Pre- away. Ryan Presley, with this time is on the Astros, has been a, a uh, by the numbers like one of the best closers in baseball. This is kind of what it looks like when it's like there's a different a, level a here. A step above that. Yeah, there's a step above that where it's not even stressly. It, no, it's well, no. I mean, boom, 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 boom. Sit down. S- since the Wagner Lidge days, you haven't really had a closer that's going to get you more than 33, 34, 35 saves in a season. And Hader's a guy that can get you 40. Yeah. So yeah, he's I he's a whole nother tier of closer. Uh, another and another tier of just electric stuff too. Yeah, I mean, is is I would I would say the answer to this question is yes, but he's the most electric reliever they've had since Billy Wagner, is he not? Oh yeah, and both lefties both have that that crazy fastball. I mean, it's literally like a Billy Wagner two point I mean, Lidge and Presley have both been good for them. Yeah. Obviously, Abreu has been really good the last yeah. couple of years. Tony Sepp. Sure. <laughs> uh, I, just, you know, I was just trying to. We're just going to name random guys. Jimmy Garcia. If we were, what are you we're sipping name, on? <laughs> we're going to name some <laughs> random guys. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, Josh Hader. He was. He looked every uh, every bit worth of the ninety million Chad plus. They, oh my God, Chad Calls. We're we just going to name random ass. AJ Harris. Uh, Brad Peacock. <laughs> well, he was more starter than reliever. I think he got used in both. But. I miss Brad Peacock. Yeah. Brad yeah. Peacock could figure out the sixth and seventh innings for Tre- the ass. Trevor Miller. Shout out to him. <laughs> Okay, time to go to break. <laughs> time to go to break. All right, if you want to get in the conversation, we'll take your Astros calls as well. But uh, if you do want to call in and talk Astros or what we're going to talk about next or with the Rockets and the win streak, give us a call on the HRP listener line, 713-780-3776. That's how you can get in on the conversation. And as mentioned, when we get back, we're going to talk about the Rockets extending their win streak to 11 games. How many wins will it take to get into the playing game and pass the Warriors? That when the bullpen returns on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5.
Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, it's the Bullpen on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. ESPN 97.5, 92.5 is the Bullpen with uh, Sean Mapes, I'm Brian McDonald, and Cam Smith with the uh, hits coming back for break with the uh, next episode by Dr. Trey there. Nice, uh, nice call. Uh, bringing us back from break. He can be found on Twitter. I'm going to shout out the, the Twitter account for Cam Smith one month, once more because that was a great choice to bump back in. You can find him on Twitter at Clutch City Cam. So, Houston Rockets, 11 in a row. They're never going to lose. The Astros are never going to win, and the Rockets are never going to lose. It's like they- You knock on wood right now. <laughs> okay. okay, all right. So, uh, wait, can we sacrifice a Rockets win to get the Astros back on the winning side? Is that a choice we can make? I'm sure it's gonna. Ha- I'm sure it's gonna happen. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I don't actually think the Rockets are gonna I, 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 run the table, I and the Astros was, are gonna opposite run the table. I don't know if there's like a local wizard we could talk to, or we could wizard. like. I, I, I figure if it's like a local wizard, maybe like the tribute we have to pay is like a lower level. Like we don't quite have to. S- like, because obviously, if it's a wizard on, on like a national level, then maybe we have to sacrifice a firstborn. And I've only got the one kid, so my wife uh, wouldn't like that. But if it's a local wizard, like maybe I could just buy him some Taco Bell. I did. Are you, I, are you googling local wizard? I I did wizard near me. <laughs> uh, no, but it's a lot of it's a lot of places that just have wizard in the name. Mm, Dryer vent wizard, <laughs> dent wizard. I don't think that's it. No. 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 Hmm. No, no, uh, no. A- try fi- witch? No, <laughs> no, fix the Astros wizard. That's not coming uh, up on. Try Yelp. There might be an Astros wizard on Yelp. Ah! Oh, Yelp, uh, the website. Yeah, uh, I wasn't actually asking you to <laughs> Yelp. Thanks, thanks, Sean. Anyway, Jesus. Rockets. Yeah, Rockets. Jesus. Uh, okay. So 11. A lot more witches pop up. I don't know what that says. But okay, Rockets. 11 wins a uh, I mean, some people are into it. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with the. Uh, the I'm going to sound like an old man here. I don't know what's going on with the youth of today, but uh, maybe more people are into witches. But, yeah, Rockets win last night over against the hated Jazz. Uh, it never it never feels bad to beat the Jazz. I, I Now, obviously, you being of, uh, I guess, technically a different generation than me. I don't know how far pack, far apart people have to be to be a different generation. But you feel I think that, we clear. Do, do you feel the same hate? Because, like, jazz, for me, growing up um, – is the kid of the uh, late 80s and early 90s. The Jazz were easily the most hated team for me as a Rockets fan. And I know of, of your youth, they would have faced twice with, during the T-Mac and Yao years, but do you feel the same hate towards the Jazz as, as maybe people of my age? I don't think I feel the same hate, but I like the Jazz are probably like a bottom bottom three favorite team for me, or I guess a top three hated yeah. team for me. Who else would um, be in that group, the Mavs? Ooh, uh, so the Warriors. Oh, okay, yeah, good call. Because uh, the war, you know, the Warriors are kind of my jet. The you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. The, yeah. You faced them uh, twice in the Western Conference Finals. Yeah. yeah, and I'm not sure who the third one would be. Um, Cam, who's your most maybe, hated maybe NBA the Mavs? Team? The Mavs. Give me the Mavs. I mean, growing growing up, it was it was probably the Jazz and Spurs because that was based off who my mom hated, and yeah. you know, you you hate who. Mom hates. You, you, you hate who mom tells yeah. you to hate. But as I became a big boy and had my own thoughts, <laughs> it, uh, in the last couple of years, it definitely turned yeah, in. Yesterday. It definitely turned into the Lakers. Uh, oh yeah, good call. hating the the Lakers a lot. Um, so yeah, I'd have to say probably Lakers and Jazz have been the most consistent teams that I've Rock, just did Rockets not care did, for. Rockets did have some kind of tension filled series. There was the uh, the bulky knockbar year where he ripped off like part of Carl Malone's jersey that got a little uh, contentious. And then, of course, the uh, the year that uh, both both T Mac and Yao got hurt, and Ron Artest led them to the Rockets to Game yeah. Seven. Oh nine. Uh, was, was that two thousand nine? Yeah, I think I think you might be right. But the Rockets took the eventual NBA champion Lakers to Game Seven in the second round with uh, with T Mac out, and I believe Yao only played Game One of that series. I believe he got hurt in a game their Game One win at LA, and they still went to Game Seven. So that series got pretty contentious as well. So Lakers is a good call. I think Lakers is certainly. Uh, up there as well as far as most hated teams. Well, let's get back to the the current Rockets right now. As it stands with the eleven game win streak, obviously the Warriors. Well, unfortunately the Warriors also had a a, a bad team yesterday. They got to face the Hornets, so they win as well. So they have Rock- the Spurs coming up too. That sucks. That really sucks. Red hot Spurs though. Won three in a row. Well, maybe 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 Wimby can uh maybe Wimby can visit his local wizard and uh, get some ma- get some magic on his side to uh, to beat the Warriors and do the Rockets a favor. But the Rockets, as it stands right now, one game back uh, from the Warriors. So 
Uh, I mean, let's first talk about this game. Um, I know you. there's a lot of things to watch last night with the Cougs and the Astros on as well, but um, whatever you got to see of the game, I, I did find it interesting that Jalen Green scores 34 points and 30 of which are in the second half. Uh, he's been on a tear. What did you think of his the game last night? Yeah, and, and it was a, very similar to the uh, to the uh, Trailblazers game in that way, where Jalen Green comes out super super slow uh, in the first half and then score. I think he scored nineteen in the third quarter against the Blazers. Obviously, he gets I think twenty in the third quarter against. Uh, yeah, he, yeah, he, he scored 20, 20 in the third quarter last night. So. That to me, uh, and I said this after the Blazers game, and it's even more, I feel even more strongly about it. Th- these are actually not better games, but these are games that tell me more about Jalen Green and how real this uh, this leap that he's taking is. Is the games where he's not just making every shot that he takes. It's the games where sure, he-, he struggles early and then finds it, and not only finds it, but it comes as the Rockets are making a run again and are actually winning <laughs> like right it, it's like coming a as a, an effect it's yeah. coming as a part of winning and so yeah he you know it's funny where it's a game where he goes 11 of 24 4 of 11 from three which aren't bad numbers no, they're those not are bad but he like perfectly you acceptable numbers he, but i think seven threes against okc the other yes. day so it wasn't like, like seven for 11 yeah exactly which is unsustainable so yeah. you're right it, it is nice it's, it's nice and encouraging and I think a positive sign towards his, you know, the long-term sustainability of what he's doing right now, that he can go through a cold spell and then come back from it. Yes. Which it, wasn't always the case in his first two seasons. Yeah, exactly. Where it's not just, this is a bad game and there's nothing you can do about it. And Ime Udoka is pulling him with, you know, three minutes left in the third quarter and he doesn't play again, which is what was happening early in the season. Now it's, he can actually figure it out and a lot of it just goes to like he drives with a plan now like he doesn't just kind of you know get past his guy and just kind of throw himself at the rim like he you could you could tell that he is like planning out how he's setting up his finish or how he's gonna find amin thompson who's uh ducking in cutting in uh, around the basket, and Amin Thompson also. Or the play against OKC awesome. where he kicked it out to the Jabari. Kicked it out yeah. to Jabari. So he, you can tell that there is another step going on, even beyond just like he's making shots. It's it's there. There is a he has taken a step just as a player, point blank. Well, like his whole mentality, you can t- like he's just like driven now. Like whatever Ime has done with him to get him Maybe to it's this not point. Ime. Maybe it's the baby on the way. It, I, I mean. Yes, too. Which, I mean, you're gonna have to pay for that kid. So, but it's just like playing he, for that max. Concert. He's had he had so much inconsistency in his game plan, but also with the team around him. His first couple years, yeah. and you can tell that Ime has changed his philosophy of the team. But for me, even more so, it's like my biggest issue with Jalen the past couple years was like, all right, if you're not scoring, what else are you doing for us? Mm-hmm. Because you're not dishing out eight assists, you're not getting six or seven rebounds, you're not really playing defense. But these last couple weeks, I mean. He's had multiple double-digit rebound games. Yeah, you I think can, nine last night, right? Yeah, so you can tell that it. he's even more – He he's putting more of an effort towards defense. Like, he's just like a totally different ball player. And it's crazy that it's coming at a time where arguably your best player is not in the lineup. Yeah. Yeah, and, and a, a part of that, that – that's why some of the, like, Sangoon jalen thing I, I don't buy because, like – how. How how does Sungun being out make him better at defense? <laughs> like yeah. that, that, and not to mention like this streak that he's had was I think started three games before yeah. Sungun even went out. The, so the it's the I mean obviously you can just like, kind of make the cut wherever you want, but if you make if you make the kind of you know the differential between what the team has done or was doing and now is doing. You can just do from the All Star break, which which includes ten games with both of them, right? And they're both they're playing faster. They had both uh both guys out there, and Jalen was playing better. Now he's exploded the last uh, few weeks because the ball is just always in his hand. But the ball was always in his hand with Steven Silas as the coach the last couple of years. Right? He is he is improved. These are very real improvements that he's. Uh, that he's made so going forward i don't know if i i have him quite averaging like i think he's averaging like 35 in the month of month of march that's probably a bit aggressive but there's no way that he's going back to being the like borderline unplayable shooting guard that he was 
uh, for a lot of, you know, December, January, February. Yeah, and there's no way. I, there's so much more on the Rockets I want to get into, like getting getting specifically, uh, as I mentioned before, into like how many wins it's going to take to get into the playing game. We also got to talk about Amen Thompson. Because yeah. He, uh, Amen Tom, I, no, I realized I said his name both ways. Amen Thompson uh, has been absolutely fantastic. Another big game last night with the double-double. We'll carry this conversation over the other side of the break when the bullpen returns at ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. You're back inside the bullpen with the producers of ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Welcome back in ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5. Uh, last segment here of hour one of the show today. Coming up next hour, we're going to talk some Houston Texans and some comments that Saquon Barkley made on the uh, Travis Kelsey, Jason Kelsey podcast about the Texans being his first choice when free agency began. And of course, 130, we will have Mount Rushmore plus one. Uh, but continuing the conversation right now with the Houston Rockets, and if you want to join in and get, come in the conversation or get some thoughts in on the Texans or the Astros, we'll take those calls as well. Give us a call on the HRMP listener line, 713-780-3776. But, Sean, before we get to uh, the Rockets conversation, you've got something to tell the, the listening audience about where they can find us on YouTube. Yes, you can call us. You can text us. You can also look at us on YouTube at ESPN Houston. We made watching your favorite sports station even easier. Uh, we're officially streaming. We have been for a while now on the uh, ESPN Houston YouTube channel every single day. Although, I'm not sure if we do on Sundays. But do we have a Sunday show that streams? We stream at least six days a week. <laughs> 
now you can watch and listen to us anywhere and everywhere. Uh, not only can you uh, watch us, you can also interact with us. There's a chat uh, going. Uh, we have Michael H. who got in here, uh, I guess, when we were talking about the Astros. And he asked, Miss Dusty and Maldonado yet? And I'll say, no, not quite yet, but oh, one, two. Uh, Six walks, man. <laughs> six six walks. Uh, Look, yeah. Let's not act like some of these moves that a spot has made. Dusty wouldn't make either. So let's exactly. pump the brakes on missing Dusty. Yes. So Michael H. Question asked. Question answered. You can also ask questions by going uh, to U- ESP in Houston on YouTube, clicking subscribe. Makes a big difference for us. Let us know you're listening and uh, chat us up. Ask a question that we can slam down. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if I want to put that on. Like he, it was. It was. It was a, well, actually, that question was a little trolling, wasn't it? A little, little, like a little, a little, a little, little, little bit, a little bit. bit Disrespect him a little bit. A little, little, little bit troll, a little bit troll. But uh, before we get into like what the Rockets will need to win to actually get into the playing tournament, let's talk about at least one more player here who's been on just an absolute freaking tear recently. Uh, Amen Thompson, another beast of a game. 18 points, 15 rebounds, and five, five assists shot, 50% for the field. Obviously, a lot of those shots are close because he's been playing more of a, a big man role uh, out of necessity with Shingun uh, being out. I mean, I, I still think we see him as a long-term point guard, probably, because Fred Van Vliet is really only locked into this roster this year and next. But what have you what have you seen from Amen Thompson, uh, maybe the versatility he's shown and just the uh, the leap that he's made uh, still now in his rookie season? Yeah, that that's really my main takeaway is that, yes, we, we, uh, we viewed him coming out of the draft as a point guard we still kind of see him as point guard of the future point guard of the future e but uh part of the reason he's so good is that he can just play power forward on defense and center on offense for you and and be putting up double doubles seemingly uh seemingly every night Yeah. yeah so that that to me is uh is huge and we've seen already what uh how Jalen Green's jump shot has kind of uh, progressed, you know, even with one year with the new coaching staff with Ben Sullivan, uh, especially one of the assistants uh, on Ime Udoka staff. And if Eamon Thompson even gets, like, a passable jump shot, like just a a guy that you cannot just completely want shooting. You can't treat him like Ben Simmons. Yeah. Yes. he. I mean, he's he already basically is – what I would say is he plays like Ben Simmons if he had that dog in him. <laughs> if Ben Simmons, if Ben Simmons if was ben a dog, he would, play, yeah. he would play like if Ben Simmons loved basketball, he'd play like Amin Thompson. And so, yeah, I mean, he's shooting fifteen percent from three this year. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> but see, I don't even need him to be like like you said. I don't think we really even need him to be a good three point shooter. Like just be be a Rajon Rondo. Yeah, yeah like, exactly like, like, that it, exact level of shooter where the defense is fine with you shooting, but you can still have but they games. They still have to respect them enough to come out in yes. great space underneath. Yes, and I mean with the way the way obviously uh, Singoon played early in this season with the ball in his hands and with the way Jalen plays uh, has been playing of late with the ball in his hand. Like there is a uh, aspect of the offense where it's, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for him to be a more of a cutter and to be sure. more of a, uh, you know, m- play more of a two man game than necessarily, you know, like play like James Harden did where he's just high screen and roll every time, yeah. you know, like I can't that, see him that, and Thompson. That's being not that, the kind yeah. of point guard that no. he's going to be. He's going to be more of a, and honestly, th- even just saying like point guard, I feel like is, like he just kind of can play whatever he can. He can play whatever he can. Yeah. He can guard whoever, and it's not. He doesn't have a position, and not in the bad way that guys don't have a position. He doesn't have a position because he can kind of play all of them. That's a good point because I mean I think it's maybe oversaid at times, but we we always talk about how basketball has become, especially at the pro level, a positionless game. And Amin Thompson is a perfect example of that like we could try to you know box him in and label him as a point guard, but that's not really telling i think the full story of his what his role is going to be i mean i think his his his, this is kind of borrowing a term from like recruit recruiting on ncaa football back in the day how you remember how you could recruit like 
just a quote unquote athlete. Yeah. And then you can just decide later what he was going to be. That's kind of what a Min Thompson is. He's just a freakish athlete that if you if you need right now, you need him to basically play the role of a big next to Jabari Smith Jr. He could do that. If you need him to be a wing, uh, in a, or a point, he can do that. I mean, obviously, I think using him in ways that don't rely on him obviously having to be a spot up three point shooter is is a good idea. But other than that, weaknesses, you can pretty much use him any way you want. Yeah, and the fact that he's already such a positive, again, just kind of the the fact his skill set is kind of like go out there, do <laughs> do, stuff. do basketball stuff, do stuff, <laughs> yeah. and it works. And he's a he's a positive. Uh, you know, positive his, influence on the team. I think his shot has developed a little bit. Like I, the when he can I, make some mid rangers. That, that, that's what I was going to say. Like watching the OKC game more than Ben Simmons. So like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's already he's already like the floor is so high on this guy because he's already he he turned twenty one in uh, January. Oh my god, yeah, <laughs> and he's Jeez. he's already like. You like, can already kind of see what what's happening. He he was knocking down some mid range jumpers in yeah. that OKC OK, OK game, which I, was the last one I, I I got to watch in full. But uh, before we uh, before we move off, yeah, of yeah. Amin Thompson. One last thing. Do you know what his middle name is? I have no idea. Excellence. Oh, that's that's amazing. But but how do you think it's spelled? Ooh, okay, okay. So this is a East West Key and Peel bit sort of spelling. They, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, of excellence. Okay. Yes. All right. So okay. All right. I'm going to say it starts with the letter X. It starts with the letter X. Yes! Okay, all right. It, I, I mean, I, I feel like you're, you're down the road. Okay. It's spelled X-L-N-C. <laughs> I, was, I would have never gotten oh, that. Oh, really? No, no. I X-L-N-C. I would have added some more letters in there. <laughs> I was basically going to take off the E at the beginning and just it spell X. So wait, hold on. Say it again. It's uh, X-L-N-C. And... Do you, I guess it's not excellence. It's excellency. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, oh, it's excellency. There we go. Uh, also, oh my god. Uh, you know he has a twin brother in the NBA, Asar yeah. Thompson, right? Uh, of the uh, oh, he's, does he Detroit also have Christmas? a great uh, middle name? What do you think his middle name is? Let's see, if, if one is excellency, one Eminence. is uh, greatness. No, it's ex- excellency. They're both. It's they the they same both way? have the same middle name. Spell the same way. Spell the exact same wow. way. Mama Thompson, no, I mean, credit credits for creativity, but then she kind of mailed it in. It's like, you know what? Screw it. They're just going to both be excellency. Copy, copy, paste. copy, paste. We'll yeah. start with an A. <laughs> yeah, at least at least change the spelling, right? Like, or, or do that to a different word that starts with X. Like, yeah, you can yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. no. That's... Shout out, shout out to the Thompsons. They don't have to name kids. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if I, I did. I miss an opportunity to give, give my daughter the middle name of excellency. I right think there. Still, still time. Still time. <sighs> Yeah. Still time for me. Yeah, Still time for you. you yeah, the yeah. Second one. Cam, I don't know if you if you want to bring a kid in the world just so you can name him Excellency, but uh, I'm just. But I would you, like to bring a child into this world. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you want to bring a child into the world, seven one three. No. Uh, if you want to help Cam out on that front, no. ESPN uh, Houston YouTube. <laughs> but uh, uh, we're gonna go a little bit over in this break, and we'll maybe cut the Texans uh, uh, segment a little bit short on the back end because I, I do want to get quickly into kind of the, the the remaining schedule and what it's going to take for the Rockets to get in the playing game because it, it looks fairly daunting. As I'm looking at uh, the Warriors' schedule, and both teams have nine games left, including one game head-to-head, but as we were talking about in the break, the Warriors had the tiebreaker, so you can't just tie them. You actually have to finish one game better, so winning that game um, isn't enough. You still lose the tiebreaker, uh, but the Warriors, they their next game is against the Spurs. That's I mean, let's book that for a win. I think that's going to be a win, but when we look at their 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 schedule in April. I see I see five possible losses. They have two games against the Mavericks. They're have obviously as said they're going to have to come here to face the Rockets. Then they're at the Lakers on April 9th in their home against the Pelicans, who hopefully will be playing something on April 12th in their second to the last game of the season. Hopefully the Pelicans are playing for something. Uh, otherwise that might become an automatic win as well. So that's yeah. that's five possible losses. So I think best case scenario you can hope the Warriors go four and five over their final nine which would mean for the Rockets to pass them because they don't have the tiebreaker, the Rockets would have to go 6-3 and three over their final nine. And that their their remaining schedule is tough. They've got, I believe, two games against the Mavericks. And yeah, two games against the Mavericks in the final final uh, nine. Um, so those are going to be tough. Warriors, as mentioned, Timber at Wolves. the Timberwolves, home for the Heat, home for the Magic, and then at the Clippers in the season. Maybe the Clippers aren't playing for anything, and three that game, becomes an easy win. Three-game road trip to end the season, too. Yeah, that's, uh, that's rough. So, I mean, look at that schedule. Like, it's going to be tough to even go five and four. I mean, hell, it's going to be tough to go four and five down the final nine, much less get to six and four, which is, I think, what you have to at least get to 
to be able to pass the Warriors. Yeah, yeah, it, it's going to be tough. That's why six and three. I think I said six and four, but yeah, that that that's why uh, throughout throughout the whole time I haven't been like locked in on the on the ten seed race, just because to me what's what's more important is the way that they're playing, is the way the Rockets are playing, and like the. This this last obviously eleven games, but even like the last like month and a half of the season, has been like such a positive that honestly making the play in, I didn't, I I don't think any of us thought they were gonna, they had any play in hope, you know. And no, I think. I mean, don't the they already have more wins than what Vegas said yeah, they were the gonna Vegas, have all year? They're already way over their over. Yeah, the Vegas uh, win projection I think was thirty one and a half. And yeah, they're, they're at, at 30, 38. 38, Yeah. Yeah, so. and. I mean, shoot. They need, There's no they way you need, can classify this season other than a complete success, if they even go, if they miss the playoffs. If they go, if they go three and six for the next uh, nine games, they finish at 500. <laughs> Which yeah. Is, well, like no pre- one thought this team like was going to go 500 we, early in the season. Before the season, when before the season, early in the season, whenever when we were kicking it around, um, I forget our, our co-hosts have changed, so I don't remember which version of the show it was. But I we think were it was Andrew. Was it Andrew? Yeah, it probably was. Yeah, because RJ was gone by the summer. Uh, but we were kicking around like what the op- possible upside for the Rockets is adding in Shagoon and then obviously the hope that these young players with another year in the league have matured and improved as well. I think we were talking about like, okay, maybe they can win 35 games. Yeah, we were like, like being nice and saying yeah, like, like 35. And that felt like, yeah, that felt to be optimistic because they'd only won like 21 or 22 but the yeah. year before. So, yeah, if man, if they go, like you said, three and six and get to 41 and 41, complete success. Yeah. You don't get to get coached with your votes. Well, and they didn't make a move. They they didn't make right. any big they, mid-season well, it was the move they moves. did make that was important because yeah. all the rumors were they were thinking about trading away Jalen Green for Mikael Bridges, which yeah. thank God they didn't do yeah, that. Yeah, but they, yeah, like you said, they the only in-season trade they made, I think the only is the only in-season trade they made that involved actual NBA players was uh, to trade uh, Victor Oladipo, a guy who wasn't playing, for Stephen Adams, a guy who, who is not playing, is not playing. <laughs> not playing. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, like you said, it was it, this is basically the team that we thought we were going to get. Uh, as we were previewing it, and they're going to soar past their expectations with a Shingoon injury that took them out at least, what, 10 games already? Cam Whitmore's missed time. Fred Van Vliet's missed time. So I mean, Thompson missed time. Right, exactly. So, yeah, it's a uh, complete— Tari Eason's out. Like, Tari Eason yeah, Tari Eason, too, Almost the whole so. year, yeah. Yeah, they've dealt with a ton of injuries. I mean, it's nothing short of uh, it's super impressive what Coach Udoka has done with this young team. All right, we got to get out. We're a little bit over here. When we get back, let's talk bit. about yeah, yeah, well, more than a little bit. And thanks, Sean, for calling calling it out there. Hey, you're you're part of this too, pal. All right. Anyway, when we get back, we're going to talk about the Houston Texans and some comments uh, Saquon Barkley had on the Jason Kelsey Travis Kelsey podcast about the Texans being his first choice when. Uh, Free agency open. That when the bullpen returns on ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5.
ESPN Radio, 97.5 and 92.5. Uh, back here for hour number two coming up at 1.30. We will have the groundbreaking award-winning segment, Mount Rushmore Plus One. Uh, Sean Mapes here. I'm Brian McDonald behind the glass. Cam Smith. You can find us on Twitter. Cam is at Clutch City Cam. I uh, am at Sack by BMAC, and Sean can be found on the Twitter at Sean A. Mapes. Uh, brief conversation during the break about who we think at 97.5 has dipped and who hasn't dipped. I don't know if we uh, sorted out completely, but uh, it was. Uh, I, I wish the. Because I don't think the Twitch audience could hear us during the break anymore, no. can they? Yeah, yeah it's they disappointing. Don't. They miss out on some good stuff. But uh, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, or John, obviously no. He he's said so. Yeah, much. he's it's clearly said yeah. so in his in his, in his so, advertisements. Yeah. Uh, do you think Paul's ever dipped? No. He's too too fancy. Yeah. Hell no. Yeah, no. Someone would explain it to him. He'd be like, "It's <laughs> disgusting." <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that that's just what his reaction. Would be. I could see Lance doing it way back. I could see Lance growing up in Richmond Rosenberg, yeah. the hard the hard uh, his, tough streets of Richmond his Rosenberg. His dad was a football coach. Yeah, he was so a, he, an he, offensive line coach. No he, grew up, he grew up with dip in the house, <laughs> uh, without without a doubt. All right, moving on. So it came, uh, Saquon Barkley was on the uh, Jason Kelsey Travis Kelsey uh, podcast. It's called New Heights, right? Yeah, New Heights. So he was on the podcast this last week and talked about uh, what his first his choice was in free agency. Turns out that first choice in free agency wasn't the team he ended up signing with the Philadelphia Eagles. It was the Houston Texans. You did that. Was, there, there were rumors eventually or in the beginning that the Eagles were kind of in it. Were they always kind of like the top choice or they, were they the ones kind of trying to make that move happen? Or <sighs> Let's be, I'm going to be honest here, right? This is what, this is what the show is for. Really, I mean, probably the first team that had like my first interest was Houston. Ooh. It was Houston. That would have um, been, been was, dangerous too. It was really, uh, I got to communicate uh, with CJ and a couple of those boys. Mm -hmm. um, nice. Uh, but this is before, like, all the, you know, when you actually put offers on the table and talk to teams. and. So, yeah, it's – it's I don't know how you take this, but uh, I, I'm a little uh, – hearing this, I'm a little bit disappointed because we'd heard those rumors, you know, like before free agency started, that, hey, like, C or Saquon's following a bunch of Texans on Twitter. I would CJ, uh, obviously, as he mentioned there. I believe Nico and a few others were a part of that as well. Um but you never really know how much truth there is to the rumors, but there it is. It's, you know, coming out of Saquon's mouth. Like he, he wanted to be Houston Texan until the Houston Texans decided not to offer uh, a contract on the level of the Philadelphia Eagles. And he ends up going and playing for the city, city of brotherly love. Now the difference on like, if, if the Texans hadn't extended Joe Mixon, like I would have got it. Cause you're, that would have been a massive saving. Like, yeah. cause you would have paid Joe Mixon like $6 million for this year. And then been out of it, like completely yeah. as, out of it. As opposed to 13 and a half. As opposed to 13 and a half. But now the extended Joe Mixon, and now you're talking about a difference of about three and a half million per dollar, three and a half million uh, dollars per year. And and you're talking about an extra year with Joe Mixon. So you're not even uh, saving as much as much as far as the, the, the number of years. And you factor all that into not only the restructure we saw earlier in the offseason with Sheldon, not Sheldon Rankins, with, uh, with Shaq Mason. And now Titus Howard also restructured, and you opened up like sixteen and a half million worth of cap room. It's like, I kind of wish the text. If you're good, if you knew it was in the in the bag to possibly uh, save this amount of money by restructuring Titus Howard, it's like just pay for the redder running back. Like I get Nick Casario has a cap for what he's willing to spend on each player, but it kind of feels I don't know. It kind of feels short sighted. Like if 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 you have the money to do it especially if you have the tricks under the salary cap to make it work by restructuring these offensive linemen unless you just believe Joe Mixon's a, a better player which it feels hard to believe like just go out and get the better player it's not it's not the difference in like a 10 million dollar quarterback versus a 25 it's, it's yeah. 3 million dollars the yeah. last time i was here we we had talked about Mixon Jacobs Henry and Barkley and this was before they had signed contracts looking right. back was your order of who you wanted changed now that you see the money? Oh, like with their contracts oh, if, if now? Have, as, yeah. Because well, like that Derrick Henry Josh contract Jacob, wasn't bad to Baltimore. Josh Jacobs' contract is fake, though. Yeah, Especially Jacob, a one-year deal. Yeah, signed. And he should fire his agent with the with the contract he signed. So if Nick Azera could get Josh Jacobs on that uh, Josh Jacobs on that contract, yeah, then, like, a fake -ass he, he would have been number one. But, uh, but yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. Uh, that Derrick Henry yeah. contract to Baltimore, like I'm, that, that's a pretty decent one. Baltimore got yeah, got with it? two years. It was two years, nineteen million, I think. Yeah. So a little, just under ten, $10 million dollars. Because I think I, we I were talking about him I going. I would have been fine with that. Yeah. 
I would have been fine with that. And I would have been fine with the Saquon deal. I mean, I, again, to, to kind of re repeat the point, like I get passing on 13 and a half over three or, you know, spread it out over three years, like, well, I guess 42 something. Or I think Saquon's contract has the upper ability to even get into the yeah. low fifties. Yeah. His, his contract where it's like, it's 26 guaranteed, but it's right. 37 with a possibility to get even higher. Right. So, so I get passing on that if the idea is like we're only gonna pay six million for one year for Joe Mixon, yeah. but then you extend them like and you extend them and you know you have this money hidden away that we found out later by restructuring Titus Howard's like just get the better player. Yeah, there, I mean there is a little bit if you just like compare the uh, the guaranteed money where it's thirteen guaranteed for Mixon versus twenty six for uh, there's Barkley. Still a bit, there's still a good difference. Yeah, there. you could and, and you can go like, well, it's twice as much now as opposed to like the uh, the AV like four times as much. Yeah, like, yeah. And so you could you could kind of see where you're like half as much. But I, I I'm glad you brought up the restructuring uh, that they've done restructuring Titus Howard's contract. They restructured someone else's contract. Shaq Mason earlier. Shaq in Mason. Season. Yeah. Jack Mason's contract, where now they have I th about twenty million in space. Yeah, and, well, or the the, abi the, the, the ability to use twenty million in space. I think the Titus Howard deal itself opened up like ten, and then Shaq Mason was like six or seven. Yeah, and then yeah, but they've opened up like it, it begs the question. Okay, what the, where are they cooking? What are you? Yeah, what are you opening up the salary cap space to do? Because you're not restructuring Titus Howard just to be a you know detour, right? You're 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 restructuring Titus Howard so that you can then spend that money on something. Maybe is it the Nico Collins extension that people uh, that, that I mean, Ty, Nick Casario brought it up unprompted yeah. at the combine about hey, we have to keep some of this money around. Like maybe we rework uh, uh, Nico Collins, so that might be it. But there's still some safeties out there that I think are interesting, a wide receiver or two that are interesting, but, but they're not they're not guys that are going to take up the amount of money that you have under the cap. Yeah. It's not like there's there's no huge splash move that you had to make a bunch of money available for. Yeah, so te this is from uh, Texans Cap at Texans Cap on uh, on Twitter. He has them after the uh, Titus Howard restructure. He has them at 31.7 uh, projected cap space. And two million uh, for the draft class. Uh, so like twenty nine ish, yeah, twenty eight, so, twenty nine, yeah, twenty nine ish. So that you don't need to restructure this money though to get Quandre yeah. Diggs, Isaiah or, Simmons, yeah, Justin or, uh, Simmons, or Justin Simmons, not yeah. Isaiah Simmons, uh, Justin Simmons, like. Not really. What, yeah, if you want you to need. go out and sign like Tyler Boyd for wide receiver, and then like Quandre Diggs, you don't need twenty nine. Yeah, you don't need twenty nine million to do that. Yeah, it, it is interesting. I mean, I I don't really I don't have an answer. I guess my my lean would be a Nico Collins. Uh, it feels like contract. I feel like that's it. But I, I'm not sure. So going back to the Saquon Barkley thing, it is hard to. Uh, it's funny because it, it it keeps feel. It feels like. At several different points, we've had different opinions about Saquon Barkley versus Joe Mixon, like you laid out, where it's beforehand. Uh, well, beforehand, we didn't really even know Joe Mixon was that much of an option for uh No, I didn't know he Texans. was an option until it happened. But then when they trade for him, and then you look, and he, one year, $6 million was was on left on his contract versus the deal that Saquon got, you're like, okay, I get it. Yeah, now, completely. Now the extension, you're like, well, hmm. And now that they restructure, now it's like, wait, so money was really not an object yeah, here? Yeah, like that, to me, that, I, but then, putting, putting off-field stuff aside, just player to player, like if I'm doing like a side-by-side -side comparison of Saquon and Joe Mixon, like what, you know, like, you know, they're working as a run, runner between the tackles, they're working on the outside, speed, age, all these different qualities that you would judge them on. I pretty much have the check on the Saquon side for pretty much damn near everything. So, it, it, like... Like doing this thing with Joe Mixon seemed like a money saving move, but clearly they didn't need to save money as we saw with the yeah. restructure. So it's just like it feels especially when you combine it with walking away from Sheldon Rakins over one million dollar per year. Yeah. Like I, I get three million dollars, three and a half million dollars per year for a running back is is a fairly sizable gap still. But when you combine it with the Sheldon Rankins, like oddly walking away from that deal over one million dollar per year, walking away from the better running back for three and a half. When you have all this room, as we talked about, it's just, I don't know, it feels like Nick Casario is being maybe a little too hardlined with his, uh, like, the this is the absolute ceiling that I'm going to pay for this player. Like, if if the player is better and you got the money, just go a little bit over. What's the big deal? Yeah, and, and like like I was saying with the, how we feel differently on different times with uh, Saquon, 
there is a little bit of we need to know what we still don't actually the dust hasn't fully settled i guess with with the, we still have 39 million dollars uh left that were in cap space that we're looking at being like what, what's happening here so there is a, a level of the the book isn't completely written so maybe they make some moves and we're like you know what now we get it you know yeah, like, sure there still is the option for it but I, it is at the very least very puzzle or not puzzling just it's actually just interesting the way that nick Casario, uh has gone about uh this offseason, uh, he's taken a very non-linear path. Like yeah. you, would, you would have thought, like this Titus restructure would have come like towards the, the beginning. beginning. Yeah, to, so yeah. like, okay, now we know how much we have to work with. But instead, he signs all these guys, passes on others. Is like now he goes back once. You know, there's still some decent players we mentioned. You know, some of the safeties and wide receivers. But now he restructures. Like I don't know, it just it feels very non-linear. It 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 is very strange, and you know, part of the. Um, Part of the uh, was it Sheldon Rankin? No, who'd they trade? Malik, Malik Collins. Collins. Part of the Malik Collins deal was the idea that it was uh, going to be for. I mean, it's reported er, originally that it was, was going to be one for, for one. Eric Armstead. Yeah. And so I, I wonder how much of this, how many of the moves that are especially head scratching were moves before other moves that then didn't happen. So how, how how many of the plans kind of got scuttled? Like like we saw with the Rockets off season where they thought they were going to get Brook. I think we were like on air when we thought they were, they were going to sign uh, Brook Lopez. Uh, actually, I don't think you were here that day. I think it was just uh, Andrew and you I. You and Andrew could have been. Yeah, we're at the end of the show. We're like, oh, looks like they're going to sign Brook Lopez. <laughs> oh, you know what? Yeah, because my my daughter's birthday is right at the beginning of July, right when yeah. the agency opens. I probably was out that day. Yeah. So um, lazy. So. Uh, <laughs> That that is the, the yeah. So there is, and obviously we just talked about what happened with the Rockets this season. So so the the plans falling through and the moves that you make under a different set of expectations not working out. Now you have to make moves to recover, and so there's a lot of moving parts in 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 an off season. Ultimately, I'm not sure how much of this will actually matter, like on the field uh, when when. September rolls around where, you know, are they going to lose a game because Joe no, Mixon isn't Saquon I, Barkley? Are probably they, not. It's are, just, I, I guess it's just an overall. It's like, an overall, just it's just interesting. It's just it's an overall <laughs> interesting, like, kind of uh, look into the, the idea yeah. of what Nick, how Nick Casario wants to build a team and, like, maybe questioning, like, I, I put it in there, in the, I think the, the, the tweet to promote the show is, like, are the Texans being cheap? And that's, sensa- you know, uh, sensationalizing a little bit. But it does feel like, Sometimes they're unnecessarily sticking to too strict of a budget, like on a player by player basis. Yeah, and and again, we don't know if we're seeing ninety five percent of the whole pair. Oh, probably not, because they sure. still need to do what, the draft. What they, what they spend the, the salary yeah, cap on will tell us. So the are story. they only like sixty five percent the way through right. their off season, or seventy five, eighty, and it's all just draft, and then they'll roll over the cap space until next year. It, it's. It's very interesting. I I kind of hope that it is just a Nico Collins extension, maybe a uh, maybe a defensive player here or there, a defensive veteran a safety, here or there for sure. I would like to say, yeah. And and then if if that's like all right, then they go to the draft, draft you know whoever you know interior lineman, uh, either defensive or offensive interior lineman, and another defensive back and a wide receiver and then call it a day for as, as far as like the top pit top four rounds yeah yeah okay that 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 makes sense i i can see the vision there's it's certainly just, pieces of the puzzle missing just, right now nick is has thrown us for a loop yeah i know very clearly has thrown us for a loop all right we got to get out a little bit over again we will try to catch up on the clock here uh coming up next we're going to talk about uh an unfortunate early exit for the houston cougars uh in the ncaa tournament losing last night uh, to Duke, and we have uh, also we're going to try to get to if we can, if there's time, some audio from Jay Williams, a former Duke Blue Devil, about a change he wants to make to the NCAA tournament that I'm not in love with. I'll, I'll get a uh, Cam and Sean's reaction to as well when we turn on the bullpen. ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5.
You're listening to The Bullpen on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Welcome back in ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5. It's The Bullpen here with the producers of ESPN 97.5. Uh, the three segments left. The next segment will be our Mount Rushmore plus one. But right now, fortunately, we got to talk about those Houston Cougs. I know Paul Gallant is feeling the sting of that loss the most. He is the biggest Cougs uh, stand here at the station. But... Uh, I mean, you the, the, the Cougs lose by three points, and Jamal Shedd left with – I don't remember exactly how much was left in the first half. I know it was, what, maybe four or five minutes left in the second half? Yeah, I was going to Something say. like that. Uh, so, definitely, obviously, over half the game, and you, you lose Shedd for over half the game, and they still only lose by three with some pretty uh, rough shooting stretches mixed throughout the game. They, they, they went on several cold spells. I know there was one point um, when they went to the under four uh, break in the first half where the, the Blue Devils had uh, eight turnovers, only six field goals made, yet we're only down by one. And so, um, unfortunately, the, the the cold stretches for the Houston offense, even before Jamal Shedd went out, because I think that gets lost a little bit of this. Everyone's just going to point to Shedd. But the bad offense, other than that opening stretch where they w- got up like 6 nothing and they were clicking all cylinders, yeah, the offense was going cold before Shedd went out. And then once Shedd went out, they just had no no organization on offense. I mean, I mean, uh, L.J. Cryer was trying to kind of run point while also being the main scorer, uh, but there was just no organization on offense, and they didn't have a rhythm for the rest of the game, other than a brief stretch in the second half where they, I believe, tied it. But it was it was that was a rough offensive game for the Cougars. Yeah, Ro- I mean, Roberts did a did a decent job. I mean, again, having to be thrown in that position where he all of a sudden has to kind of become like the big man hub of the offense. Yeah, he kept just... trying to run in and do like the left-handed little like jump hook. Yeah. And they, the, Duke was waiting on him. They knew exactly what he was going to do every yeah. time. Yeah, and it's it's a situation where it's like, yeah, yeah. It, when Shed goes out and more than just, uh, yeah, so Shed played 13 minutes. So. Yeah, he yeah, only had two better. points of the game, one for five. Um, Yeah, so, yeah, it was like six I mean, it, it, first. this is just – it's a reoccurring thing, I feel like, with this team the last couple of years. Free throws and injuries. I mean, Yeah, because co- they, they were down three significant players before they even got to the tournament. And then, obviously, you lose Shred for over half the game. And then the same thing happened. I forget the name. Who was it last year that got hurt right before the tournament? Or actually, in the tournament. Was, was it Marcus Sasser that got hurt in the, in the first round of the tournament? That was 2022 when they lost Sasser and, and somebody else. And then even last year, Shed was hurt going into the yeah. tournament. Okay. So it's just like That's what it was. all yeah, their guards the, every year. The Big 12 tournament or something. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's right. They weren't in the Big 12 yet. So it's just, man, it, it feels because you, you have the final four appearance in 2021. Then they, they take a, a, a tiny, tiny step back to the Elite Eight the next year. Uh, and then these last two seasons, both as number one seeds, you only get to the Sweet 16, which, I mean, on its surface, you have to, I mean, you can't really call it anything other than the disappointment. But when you add the context of the injuries to it, you certainly understand what happens. But. I feel bad for Cougs fans because these last two years, it felt like they were right there with, you know, UConn and a few other teams as the best teams in the nation, and then just injuries hit them at the absolute uh, worst possible time. Yeah, I mean, you had a lot of higher seeds lose in this uh, Sweet yeah, 16 could, round, too. Yeah. So there is Kentucky, a little bit. Arizona, well, Kentucky lost the first round, but Arizona lost. To yeah, Clemson. UNC, Arizona are one, a one and a two lost. Uh, Iowa State's a two that lost, and there's another one last night, wasn't there? Oh, oh, Marquette lost. Yeah, Marquette uh, is a two. Well, of course, Shaka Smart. I yeah, mean, yeah. Well, what Shaka Smart? Like, other than, man, maybe this is some 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 stings from his time on the Forty Acres, but other than that one year at VCU where he shocked the world as an eleven seed and got to the Final Four before losing to Butler in a game that I was at because the Final Four was in Houston, his term is resume other than that one year of vcu just yeah. is not good yeah he has oh, what i think he's five and ten since that uh, uh since let me see I, I think i saw this stat somewhere i, I think he's five and ten in the tournament yeah I'll, as, as you're talking about here i'll, I'll give yeah. a quick look but yeah it's it's not an impressive tournament record yeah and even even this one as we're for some reason just bearing shock smart not that I, i'm not saying no but no it's okay so <laughs> this was before the turn tar- before the tournament started he was three and nine in the NCAA tournament since that Final Four run. Okay, and then they won. They two won games. two games, lost one, they, so he would be five and ten. They beat a fifteen seed and a ten seed that was in right. the play-in, yeah. and so then lost to an eleven even, seed. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So five and ten, and it, like it's hard to even give them credit for the two wins they had in the tournament. Yeah, year. I mean, and Duke, 
I had, hey Duke, you thought you thought you were gonna uh you thought we we're gonna just gonna dump on Shaka Smart. Nope. We noticed that you beat a thirteen, a twelve, and then Houston without their best player for seventy five percent of the game. Can, it, I, it is crazy how some teams just get so lucky. We're, we're like oh, with the draw, like the, uh, the 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 path just opens up right in front of them. Yeah, and at the same time you have other teams that are like great programs that just haven't made like an elite eight in like fifteen years <laughs> or like yeah. twenty years. <laughs> yeah, like, and then you have Dan There's, Hurley view complaining about how tough his 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 draw is <laughs> they win every game by, 25. Win every game by yeah. 30 yeah I'm like shut up Dan yeah Hurley. but you have like teams like you know i think uh iowa has has hasn't made a sweet 16 in like 25 years God, and so yeah. you're like and it's crazy you think that one year you just be a two seed well hell uh <laughs> we, we we just mentioned uh who, who was it advanced oh alabama well we didn't mention them, but alabama Make it, make it the, uh, the Elite Eight, uh, defeating North Carolina on Thursday. That was their first Elite Eight trip since 2004. Yeah, yeah. And only the second in school history. The only school, up until up until a few days ago, their only uh, trip to the Elite Eight was 2004. Now they're going back for the second time in 20 years. Yeah, so it does It does kind of go to show that it, it, there is a lot of luck that goes into this tournament. Like, obviously, over a bigger sample, you can see someone like Izzo, good tournament coach. Other guys, not so much. Shock smart. But, uh, well, you I know, love that we transition our like our, our our hurt feelings for the Cougs going out to just bearing shock. Yeah. Smart. Well, I was gonna try to <laughs> l- l- land the plane and say it's about luck, and unfortunately for the Cougs, they just got terrible luck uh, last night. Yeah, it's just man, it's, it's rough. I, I feel bad for you know all the diehard Cougs fans like Paul Gallant. Um, yeah. Uh, no one, no one bleeds. Um, no one bleeds. Was it? What, what, what were the reason? Crimson? Is it crimson? I think so. Red? Uh, red? <laughs> I don't know. They don't just say red. Cam, uh, you, you're a UH guy too, right? Yeah, well, yeah. What, what is the official names for the colors? Is it crimson and cream? Is it What, what are the color names here? I don't think it's crimson because that's more of a darker red like yeah, Bama's is, color. Okay. Um, okay. But yeah. Is I, it scarlet? N- <sighs> No, because that's uh, that's, well, Rut- that's what Rutgers calls theirs. Oh, you're right. Yeah, the, the Scarlet Knights. The, yeah. They say that their colors are scarlet red and albino white. The, albino the, the, white. The Cougars. Yes. Okay. There we go. So scarlet red and albino white. That's hmm. interesting. And then they have the Pantones, if, in case you're wondering. I, well, now, what, well, I, now they're making a differential, like on the official colors. It's red, and then dark red, and then gray. Okay. All right. Well, hmm. well, let's let's move on. Let's hmm. move. Let's move on. No. Uh, no. Let's spend another five minutes <laughs> on on, on t- official team color. Yeah. Color I'm talk. Looking at their fonts uh, now. So I mean, uh, I, we'll, we'll, and we'll skip the Jay Williams audio uh, uh, cam. So don't worry about that. Uh, I'll I'll just keep it short. Uh, Jay Williams wants to expand the tournament to like 112 teams. He can he can get bent on that. That's a yeah. terrible, terrible stupid idea. stupid yeah. idea. Participation trophy uh, culture. Right uh, there. Uh, part of this back po- in my day, uh, only part- 64 made it. <laughs> Part of part of it, I actually wouldn't mind going back to sixty four. But part of his overall point was, uh, was like, like when you expand, like he was laying out, like, oh, you can have twenty four games on Tuesday and twenty four on Wednesday, and then after that, you're back, you're back at what we know now. And like his point at the end is like, well, you're not watching some of these games anyway. Well, if we're not watching these games, why are we adding more? Like, <laughs> yeah. if with worse saying, teams, it was worse teams. Like, it's just. Like you have teams making the tournament now, they're like twenty and thirteen. Like I mean, they're they're a good team, but it's not like they're some unstoppable team that is producing a high level of uh, of basketball to watch on TV. And now you want to take teams that are ranked like forty spots below that? No thanks. Yeah, yeah, because everybody was really excited to watch Presbyterian play. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if if they want to do a thing where they add like four more, yeah, I could, I could get whatever. With, I could get with seventy two. I'm not, I'm not, you know, not asking for it, but it's like sure. Right. You know, it's yeah, if they want to add like a, wanna, another four playing games, whatever. It, there's just a yes, exactly. There's there's a couple steps before having four games on Tuesday and uh and Wednesday of the playing games right. versus 24 yeah. <laughs> games that that yeah, he was asking. Yeah, because imagine like right now on it's Thursday, impossible to watch them. Of, right, yeah, because right now on Thursday and Friday, and I love the first two days. 16? It's, it's 16 games a day exactly, and it's impossible to watch all of them because of the way they stagger the times. And I love the format because it's just nonstop wall to wall basketball, go ending to end. But last he wants, five minutes, to last five. But minutes, he wants yeah. to add eight games to that when it's already impossible to watch it all as With it is. Crappier teams. <laughs> Literally every college basketball team would then be 
in a tournament because you still have this the NIT and then you even have the third oh tournament God, yeah, the CMT or whatever it's CBI. called it's just like CBI, so essentially it's yeah. like Did everybody is getting Huh? Did you call you, it the CMT? I don't even know the what CMC the CMC Music Factory. <laughs> I don't even know what the third tournament is, but at this point, it's just like okay, everybody's getting a participation trophy. Yeah, yeah like and just I, like no, oh, I hate it. All right, we're a little bit over. We got to get out because we have Mount Rushmore plus one on the other side when we turn on the bullpen. ESPN Radio ninety seven five and ninety two five. Welcome back in Houston, ESPN Radio, 97.5 and 92.5. And it is that time, the time for the groundbreaking award-winning segment, Mount Rushmore Plus One. Sean Meggs, Brian McDonald, Cam Smith behind the glass. Who wants to lead off with their uh, Mount Rushmore Plus One this week? Any, any uh, volunteers want to lead off? If not, uh, I will I will take it because mine is I'll, – I'll go ahead and take it. Mine, okay. is, mine is March Madness theme, so – uh, I'll go ahead and take it as the carryover from the last segment. I'm going with my my Mount Rushmore plus one is my own personal March sadness Mount Rushmore plus one. Uh, not like the biggest upsets in, in NCAA history, not like uh, the the best games, but just the ones that like personally for me only made me very sad. And so this is my Mar my March sadness Mount Rushmore plus one. I wasn't actually alive for this one, but it still makes me sad when I see uh, the highlight of this because it's like man. That would have really sucked if I was alive and I was invested in this. But when Akeem Olajuwon didn't block out in the NC State game, they were able to get an offensive rebound off a of heave from half court and put it back in to win the national title. Man, I feel bad for older Cougs fans living through that. Obviously, the, the Cougs haven't gotten back to the national title game. Uh, well, actually, no, they, did get, they got back to the national title game the very next year. But after Akeem left, they haven't been back to the national title game since then. You so. weren't alive for that? Huh? You weren't alive for that? No, no. Well, thank, thanks, but no, no I wasn't like that. Barely, barely, <laughs> barely shocked. <laughs> barely. Uh, I believe Keem's rookie year was the year I was born, so I was barely not alive for that. Okay. It, but it still counts, damn it. It's still before my time, so don't make me that old. I'm, uh, 
40, yeah, I was just surprised. I was like, 40 is the new 60. That's what I keep telling myself. Something like that. Wait. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, no, don't question it. Just keep keep rolling. Just ignore it. That's all right. So Houston, NC State from way back in the day when I definitely wasn't born yet. Um, now I no, kind of think you were. No, number one. No, you can check my driver's this is license. Danny Almonte. It's, it's right there over <laughs> the table. Um, this is number one on my March Sadness, Mount Rushmore plus one. Uh, next two, both uh, Texas related. Uh, last time, Texas, I believe. One of only two times Texas has been the Final Four. I think they got to one back in the Stone Age some sometime when none of us were alive. But uh, getting to the Final Four um, in two thousand, I think it was two thousand three with TJ Ford. Obviously, was super excited. Then Carmelo Anthony basically one man teamed you. And I mean Jerry McNamara and Keem Warwick were also pretty good on that team. But it it felt like you just run into an absolute bus all. That was that made a. Uh, a young, a young Brian McDonald, very sad to see the the the, the only Longhorn Final Four of my lifetime go down to a one man show they, with they Carmelo made, Anthony. They made others in your lifetime. 19, not, a, not a Final Four. Yeah, 1943 and 1947. You, you, you son of a. Uh, I came. You want to co-host uh, for the last segment? I think I'm okay. I think I'm gonna head out. I'm, we'll, you're you're the, no, you're there. You're the one who got on a ladder and took the ball out of the peach basket, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, me and Dr. James Naismith. Uh, yeah, we, we went to the same high school. Did your life uh, alert go off during that game? No, no. I, I luckily I didn't fall down. I, I I have I have one of those the uh, those what do they call the things that you sit on to go down the stairs? Uh, oh yeah, the <laughs> little like seat that just <laughs> buzzes its way. Yeah, down. I have one of those, so I'm fine. I, I kind of want one. Of I haven't. Those. I mean, I haven't broken my hip in at least six weeks. Uh, so my next one on my March sadness uh, Mount Rushmore plus one. Uh, a little bit further along in the Texas uh, timeline, I believe this was 2006. Your LSU made the Final Four with Glenn Big Baby Davis and um, oh oh I'm, I'm Tyrus, Tyrus Thomas Tyrus yeah there we go Garrett Temple is also Garrett yeah, yeah that was a good team but Texas was right there they had a great run themselves getting to the Elite Eight lost to LSU in a very very tight game I don't I don't know if you have the final in front of you it looked like you might have been looking it up but oh no uh yeah that that was the game that went down to, I think it actually went into overtime if I'm if I, I believe it did. yeah I believe it went into overtime just absolute heartbreaker. Thought the Longhorns would get back to the Final Four, only to have uh, Glenn, Babe, Glenn uh, Big Baby Davis and the gang knock the Longhorns out. 70 to 60. Se- uh, 70 to 60? That w- yeah. w- wasn't overtime, though, right? There was an overtime. Yeah, okay. Uh, LSU won overtime 18 to 8. Yeah, see? See? Sadness. Absolute <laughs> sadness. All right. Uh, two more. This one, this one is because uh, I had a little bit riding on it. I had some money on the uh, UConn Huskies way back to uh, – Get, all they had to do was get to the Final Four, and I would have won some money. And all they had to do to get to the Final Four was to beat George Mason. Mm. They did not beat George Mason. George Mason somehow won that game and cost uh, cost me some money. So that was a, a, a definitely a, a – Was that a, also 2006? Uh, it might have been. I think that was – yeah, I think you're right. I think that might have been – yeah, it was the same year. Uh, yeah, because LSU went on to play uh, UCLA in one yeah. half of the bracket, and then George Mason uh, lost to Florida, the eventual national champion. On the other side of the Final Four, uh, so that one that one sucked. And then recency bias, man. I feel bad for Cougs fans. Last night, you, you, you're a better team than Duke. I, I think we saw that in the first in the first part of the first half when Jamal Shedd wasn't hurt. Uh, Duke at one point had like six turnovers to one field goal made. It was clearly clear as day that the Cougars' defense was really frustrating um, the uh, Duke Blue Devils' offense until they found a way to uh, pass out of the double team that they kept throwing at uh filipowski but man I, I feel bad for cougars fans like paul gallant and uh yeah m- number one on my march sadness list or maybe not number one but uh the last one on my list uh losing last night to uh duke when jamal shed misses over half the game that one really sucked yeah yeah it, i mean it did i'm still looking at the lsu texas box score <laughs> from 2006 lamarcus well, uh, aldridge no show alert Two oh, for yeah? 14, four points. What, uh, Abram, didn't Ab- no, Abrams had the big shot against West Virginia, I think, in the Sweet 16 that year. What did he do in that game? Uh, two for seven, six Oh, also not good. Also no. not good. Uh, it, just throw a name out there. Chances are they didn't shoot well. <laughs> uh, was P.J. Stuck- Tucker P.J. Tucker, team? four for 11. Four for 11, the man. Longhorn shot 30% from the field. Yikes. Yeah, LSU was tough, man. Obviously, uh, Tyrus Thomas was so long on the inside that if you try to get into the paint, I mean – him and B- Big Baby Davis also taking up room. It was it was really hard to score inside on those guys. Yeah. All right, uh, uh, Cam, you want to go next? What is your uh, Let's Mount run Rushmore it. plus one? So mine is also March Madness. I'm okay. glad I switched it up a little bit because I was going to kind of go the, the teary-eyed way. But 
Well, Sounds like you're getting choked yeah, up already. You're, you're just, you're just <laughs> going to so make sorry. it through this? You're just thinking about I'll be sad right. BMAC. I, 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 okay. I know NC you, State game. You, you thought of me getting sad about the Longhorns losing in the Final Four in 1943. You just you can't handle it. It's all right. I can, I can go. Like Jimmy Valvano. I can just go downstairs <laughs> when this is over and drink my tears away. Uh, no, so I, I went um, – my route I went was picking the – the players that have played for U of H, putting them on a team and seeing which like that team can run the table. Mm-hmm. So the best five, the best five. So I went Jamal Shed, Otis okay. Birdsong. Man, you get teared up again. <laughs> yeah, you'd think <laughs> you about it, right. the injury. That's what happened. <laughs> Clyde Drexler, Elvin Hayes, and Hakeem Olajuwon. So if I had to build a little U of H dynasty team that I think could run the table, and I mean run the table, I'm talking about possibly an undefeated season. Okay, so you said Elvin Hayes, Akeem, Clyde Drexler, Jamal Shedd. Who was the fifth? Otis Birdsong. Okay, okay, yeah. I don't, that, I don't, that, I don't see any – do you see any flaws with that? Like, no, that that five – I mean, other than, like, the Duke and Kentucky UNCs of the world, like, that yeah, that's about as good of a five Duke, as you're going to get. Duke, uh, UNC, and – I would Kansas. probably throw UCLA into that as yeah. well. UCLA could probably throw up a five that would challenge that, but uh, especially at the big man position. I mean, they had Bill Walton and Cream run through there, yeah. but uh, uh, yeah, that's man, yeah, that that team. Uh, they still don't have a title, man. It's, it's they should have got one in the eighties, and I, I I don't know if we could say should have got one in this current run by Kelvin Sampson, could but I, I certainly deserve think they deserved a better fate than the one they got the last few years as the number one seeds that got bounced in the Sweet 16, largely in part because they were hurt. It's certain, it, it sucks, man. March sadness, March sadness. What do you got, Sean? All right, my uh, Mount Rushmore plus one in honor of uh, yesterday in Houston sports. Oh, wow. My list got messed up. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Mount Rushmore plus one of teams that are easy to hate. These aren't. Ooh, so these are like so to honor to not honor Duke, but in in reference to Duke, the, these are teams that are not necessarily the teams that you hate the most, but okay. it's the teams that for hating them just kind of comes natural to okay. not just sports fans, but I feel like even just people just casually walking by TV, they're like, hey, bleep those Screw guys. Those guys. Uh, you mentioned one of them, Duke. Yeah, yeah. yeah I feel like at this universal. Point, it's just it's just universal and it's just uh, reflexive at this point. Anyone not on Tobacco Row and hell, not even all on Tobacco Row, but anyone not on Tobacco Row just hates Duke. Yeah. Uh, next up, the New York Yankees. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Very F easy. The uh, easy, easy, easy to cast them as the villain. Now, it, se- it seems. I, I'm, I'm, maybe we'll see if this is a trend, but I, ha- I it feels like a large part of this is sometimes the annoying how annoying the fan base is as well. Uh, next up, the Dallas Cowboys. See, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the trend, the trend holds. The trend holds. <laughs> the a large part of this, I think, is how annoying the fan base is. And 100 percent right. And uh, there, there's we a hate lo- Duke, we hate the Yankees, and we hate the Cowboys. A lot of overlap there too. Uh, somewhere where there's a little less overlap, uh, but also a team I feel like comes very easy to hate. We talked about it a little bit earlier, the Utah Jazz. Oh yeah, F the Jazz, man. Because uh, thinking oh. about thinking about. Because I, I tried to go one for each uh, sport, you know, sure. try not to just name five NBA teams. Um, the Lakers and the Celtics like win. The Jazz actually haven't won They've anything. They've never won a title, yeah. <laughs> but everyone universally hates them. Which really, I mean, no, no other team on this on this list can say that. That we don't really yeah. have a have a history of winning. Is, everyone hates us. Is any non winning like is any team without like a, a, a blank, title a blank ton of titles hated as universally as the Utah Jazz? I don't think They're so. They're a loser franchise that's still hated. <laughs> Everyone's still like bleep those guys, and uh, so yeah, so Yankees Good do call. Jazz. As Cowboys. Oh, last one, college football. Some could honor, uh, argue Texas, uh, but I, I don't, I don't believe that. So I'm gonna go Notre Dame. Yeah, bleep those F guys. Notre Dame. F bleep Notre those Dame. guys. Also, have a really. It seems like Cam might have disagreed with the Notre Dame call. I don't disagree. I just it, that that kind of took me off See, guard. I said Alabama. Alabama's up maybe there. that's recency bias, but maybe because I also was trying to. You know, go away from like, yeah, they just win a million titles. I, I think you went away from Alabama because we're now in the SEC. Yeah, we're, we're protecting, who, we're protecting our brethren. Who could hate an SEC team? <laughs> hey, our Longhorns are in the SEC now. They're SEC. In the, they're in the SEC. Elite Eight. I know who I'm rooting for. Are you chanting SEC? SEC. Every time, SEC. Every time Alabama hit a three against North Carolina, were you chanting SEC? SEC. <laughs> SEC. <laughs> All right, we got to get out. We'll finish up next with the worst person in sports this week. 
and what we love from sports this week. That when the bullpen returns for our final segment this week on ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5. You're back inside the bullpen with the producers of ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. One segment to go on this week's edition of the bullpen, ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5. Before we get out of here, we, of course, have to talk about our worst people in sports this week and what we love from sports this week. Sean, I, I love your worst thing in sports this week, your worst person in sports this week. Who is your worst person in sports this week? Disgusting me, Cam. Do we have the uh, rock sound ready? The Dwayne the Rock Johnson sound ready? I can for you. Do that, yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> this uh, was at the end of Monday Night Raw. Monday Night Raw, and it absolutely disgusted me. You stay down. <laughs> that. <laughs> that. You shut your mouth. Clear my ass. How did that feel? Did that feel good? What? Just because the show's over, that doesn't mean that the sh stops. The Rock doesn't give a f uh, You should cry. You should cry, boy. Look at that blood. <laughs> now, look at this blood. Mama Rhodes. Yes. Yeah. What? Show is over and then it stops? F that. Your script? F that. Uh, uh, God. This is what happens, boy. And when you f with the final, come in here, cameraman. Now look at that face. Look at Gotta show Mama uh, Rhodes. Uh, 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 Mama Rose. 
Bye, my brother. This is for you. I'll see you at WrestleMania. Just ab absolutely, absolutely disgusting. The the they were filming a thing outside a a, a promo for uh, WrestleMania where it's The Rock and it's uh, Cody Rhodes. They film it. The director says, "Cut. We're we're out. It's the end of the show." And then The Rock just keeps going. The, there's such thing. It's as, not exactly what happened. <laughs> there's decorum. <laughs> It was after the show, but uh, there, there was no promo there. Or not uh, promo, but you know, like yeah, yeah. the is the end of the show. They it were was filming the end of the show. Yeah. Some, filming something for end of the show. Well, and then no, the, well I, I don't want. I don't want to. I don't want. I don't go. This like, is why people don't like wrestling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I was. I was debating. I was like, ah, should I correct him? Like, not. And I'm not. So go ahead. It's the, the cameras. The ca cameras were off. The yeah. Cameras were off. Although we did get to see all this. Uh, the cameras were off. They said it was clear. The, in, there's something called professionalism. I'm sorry, and doing that, unprofessional. Dwayne, if I, uh, Dwayne, are you watching? Okay, let me speak into the camera. Dwayne, if you have a problem at 9:59 on Monday night, your problem ends. You can pick up your problem at seven o'clock on Fridays when it comes to SmackDown. Very unprofessional. Very if, unprofessional. If you have a problem, save it for the next show. Exactly. Ah, right, anyway. Exactly. All right. Disgusting. Uh, <laughs> I. Yeah, and uh, we. Uh, so anyway, uh, next up my, uh, for my my worst person's worst, we we won't play the audio from this because we're we're running behind here. But uh, my, uh, I mentioned to fake tough guy Jeff McNeil of the New York Mets who uh, got all pissy about Reese Hoskins sliding late and sliding uh, past the bag. It's not so much that he was mad about getting slid on late; it was the way he handled it, just the complete fake tough guy nature of it. He had every chance to actually do something about it when he was standing over Reese Hoskins laying on the ground. But he waits till the bench is clear and the bull, everyone from the bullpen runs out to where they can like, separate them and stand between them. And then he wants to start talking tough. I, I hate fake tough guys in baseball. But uh, anyway, we're running short on time. We only got a, a we, we only got like a minute left here, so we're gonna have to do real tight here. Uh, what is your uh, what is your now that we're done with the English sharks, we swim over to the sea of tranquility. Sean, what is your thing that you love from sports this week anthony edwards in a game uh for the number one seed the minnesota timberwolves and the uh denver nuggets uh the timberwolves were up 110 to 96 with 45 seconds left he was shooting free throws and he asked the bench if he could uh, shoot the free throws left-handed yes the two best teams in the western conference their game was coming to an end and anthony edwards was like hey can i shoot this left-handed was uh he wanted to shoot the free throws left-handed, asked permission from the bench. <laughs> the bench uh, said, no, shoot right-handed, please, because they're going to kick our ass in the playoffs if, if we stun on them this hard in March. And so he shot him right-handed instead. Uh, my thing I love from sports this week, I will not describe it. Just hear the clip right now from Mark Jones, uh, King's play-by-play -play voice. They got two on Fox. Luka helped double for the tie, Barnes! And another chance. Ellis, 10 on the shot clock. Oh, it'll go into the backcourt. I'm not sure it was tipped, and that's going to be a pejorative, hurtful, deleterious turnover. The vocabulary there from Mark Jones, play-by-play wow. -play voice of the Sacramento Kings. Well done, sir. So, I, I have no idea if you nailed the use of those words mm -hmm. describing the moment that happened in that game with the Kings. But uh, to hear the vocabulary there from Mark Jones was the thing I love from sports SAT this week. words. Wow. SAT, yeah, 100%. All right, we got to get out. We are over. Up next, uh, I don't know who's on ESPN uh, National right now. It'll be two guys probably talking about maybe the final four or the Elite Eight. I don't know. They probably got something going on. But we'll, we'll be back next week on the bullpen, Saturdays, noon to 2. Have a great weekend, Houston. Talk to you next Saturday.